yeah, try to get your hands on a, on an SEM, start playing around with it, get curious, start looking at just random things for a while at my house. I was actually letting food get moldy in the refrigerator on purpose because I got fascinated with all these different types of, uh, I'm not a, a mold spore expert, but different types of foods grow different types of mold spores and mold looks really cool under the SEM. So in my early, uh, like when I first started the company up, I was, I had like, like 10 or 20 different types of moldy foods that I was uh, putting in the SEM and was pretty fascinated by that. Hey everyone, welcome to It's a Material World, where the show that uncovers why material science will change the world. Consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. It would really help us out. And also we have a free MSC company database categorized by industry sector, location, as well as internship and full-time titles. So if you're interested in that, you can find the link in the description below. And now let's get on to the episode. Hey everyone, we are excited to welcome today's guest, Neil Magdafro, owner of Electron Microscopy Innovative Technologies LLC, also known as Emmett LLC. Located in East Hartford, Connecticut, Emmett specializes in renting portable scanning electron microscopes, which can image up to 130,000 magnification and have chemical analysis capabilities. Neil holds a PhD in MSc from the University of Connecticut and has over 15 years of experience working with SEMs. Thank you for joining us today, Neil. Thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be on the podcast. Yeah, we're excited for this. I think SEM has been like, it's played an integral role in our MSc, like academic and industrial careers. So um, let's learn more about your journey. Um, so we can talk from like your initial interest in material science all the way to your decision to start an SEM business part-time in 2014. So you actually mentioned that you were part of the second undergraduate class to graduate with an MSc degree from the University of Connecticut. Um, and there were only like five students in the major. So can you just go into like why you chose MSc and what you were able to use from that background when starting this business? Sure. So um, actually coming out of high school or, or late in my high school career, I had never even heard of material science and engineering. It was still I don't know, at least to me, it was very unknown. I always loved chemistry in high school. So that was one of my favorite subjects. And ironically, we had this sort of computer program in high school that you'd punch in a bunch of interests and it would spit out, you know, potential career uh, choices for you. Uh, I don't remember if that was my junior or senior year of high school, but I remember thinking this program is not going to give me anything useful. And then the the top thing it spit out was, you know, material science and engineering. And, and I had never heard of it. So I started reading about it and I was like, oh, wow, this actually sounds really cool. So I decided that I, that's, that's what I want to major in. And uh, then I started looking for an undergraduate program and realized that there weren't a lot of undergraduate material science programs in the early 2000s. So yeah, I ended up at uh, the University of Connecticut. They had just um, started a program there and I like you said, I was the second graduating class. So it was very small, five kids in my class. So a lot of my classes, there were just five of us. They, you know, at the time we're doing some combined graduate and undergraduate classes, which was, I think, helpful because, you know, we got thrown in the mix with some higher level, you know, students that had been already completed undergrad. So yeah, from there, you know, I graduated, graduated with my bachelor's degree. I went back and got a master's degree and then started working full time. But yeah, it was a, it was a great major. I was really interested in metals and ceramics. And then when I started seeing different unique applications like shape memory alloys and just all the cool different types of materials that were out there for specific applications, I really got hooked. That's awesome. Let me just start by saying that I think it's absolutely wild that in the early 2000s, a like career related test spit out material science and engineering, because that seems like it was way ahead of its time. Yeah, uh, yeah it was strange. Definitely. It was definitely. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about how you started Emmett and the uh, it says that you started while you were also working another job. What was that like? Yeah, so uh, coming out of school, I, I was working at a, an industrial research lab, pretty well-known lab, and I was 
running some of the electron microscopes there. And eventually I was, I was kind of managing and managing that lab in charge of the maintenance, keeping things up to date and the workflows and everything coming through the lab. But yeah, oftentimes actually, even at a big company where we had multiple SEMs, uh, scanning electron microscopes, I should say, um, we had access to, you know, a lot of different analysis equipment. Even we would run into times during the year where we just didn't have enough time or throughput or equipment. And so it wasn't uncommon that we would be sending samples to outside labs and then you'd wait a very long time sometimes to get, get results back. I just, I always had in the back of my mind, like, oh, it would be really nice if we could just rent a piece of equipment for a short amount of time when we needed it. And then back in probably, it was probably 2010 timeframe, maybe, maybe a little bit after that, they actually started you know, these portable desktop scanning electron microscopes existed. They were basically being used more for educational reasons, you know, taking them to colleges to get kids interested in high schools. But then they added chemical analysis capabilities to the desktop SEMs. And then they really took off and became, you know, the, they can do 95% of what a full-size electron microscope does. So when that happened in kind of the mid, kind of like 2010, 2012 timeframe, then it really planted the seed. And I was like, okay, you know, if I can ever pull this off, I think I could rent these out and there'd be business for it. So I guess my, just the first question that came to mind is like, aren't these SEMs like expensive? Like how did you acquire the capital in the first place to then rent it out? Yeah, they, they're definitely expensive. You know, when I started the business in 2014, I had been working full time for about eight or nine years at that point. You know, I, I, I had a little bit of money saved up. I actually, the first system we bought, I basically you know, sunk all my savings into it. You know, at the time, I remember just thinking like, this is crazy. It, it was, you know, we, paid, <clears throat> we paid like $60,000 for our first, our first microscope, which looking back on it now, it's like, oh, I wish I could buy them for $60,000 now. <laughs> but, um, you know, we bought a, we bought a used model that had been used as a demo system. And, you know, the company we bought it from was uh, very supportive uh, they thought it was a great idea. A lot of the other companies I was looking at, you know, because I was kind of shopping around looking to see what was out there. And a lot of the sort of manufacturers looked at me like I had two heads when I said, I, I want to rent these out. <laughs> so yeah, they were very supportive and they gave me a great deal on it. And so I started with one and yeah, at the time I was like, I was definitely scared to make that leap. And uh, my father owned his own business. He was actually an accountant. He's the one that kind of gave me that last push because I was like, oh, this, if this fails, then I'm going to, I'll, you know, I'll be at all this, I'll be out all this money. I just wasted all this, like all my savings. And he, he said, well, what's the worst thing that can happen if it fails, you know, you still have this piece of equipment, just, you can turn around and sell it and probably make most of your money back. You know, don't worry about it. And he kind of, Gave me that last little push I needed, which is great. So did you have uh, like prospective customers at that point or did you just kind of like take the leap? I had done some market research as well as I could and had reached out to, you know, some former former uh, students that were in, in college with me and other contacts that I had just kind of putting feelers out. But yeah, I didn't have, you know, like 10 people lined up ready, ready to rent the system. And yeah, I, I still remember like the first rental that I booked, which was at a company up in Massachusetts. And I was just like, oh, wow, this is, this is crazy that, you know, someone actually, someone's actually renting a system and yeah, it was, and it, it, it worked out great. It's, it's been a really great business model and we've continued to kind of grow and expand from there. Yeah. That's awesome. I applaud your efforts, by the way. That's, that's really that's amazing. awesome. Story. <laughs> well, now that we've heard about how you've gotten here, which was super amazing to hear. Uh, now we can talk about the science behind everything. So I guess going back to the very beginning, my basic understanding of a skinny electron microscope or SEM is that it's like an optical microscope, but instead of bouncing light off the surface to create an image, it bounces electrons off the surface to create an image at an even smaller scale. Could you give us a very high level overview of how an SEM works? And then what kind of length scales you can see in an SEM image? Sure. Yeah. So other than the word, maybe microscope in the, in the names, uh, you know, scanning electron microscope and optical microscopes are, they're very different. Obviously the, with any type of analysis or, or microscopy, you can only do as good in terms of imaging resolution as your, you know, the wavelength of the of the incident, either light or electron or whatever it is you're hitting the, the sample with. So obviously um, optical light 
has a pretty long wavelength, um, something on the order of like four to 500 nanometers, so half a micron. Um, and that kind of limits the resolution of an optical microscope to on the order of about a half, half a micron to a micron. A scanning electron microscope, we use the wavelength of electrons. So we shoot essentially a high energy beam of electrons at the sample. And in order to do that, we do need a high vacuum system. So the, the sample needs to be under vacuum. That's one, I guess, difference with an optical microscope. But the wavelength of an electron beam is like 50,000 times smaller than the wavelength of optical light. So we can look at things that are very, very, very tiny. I guess another difference would be in optical microscopy, you're using optical lenses that are made out of glass that are kind of fixed lenses. In a scanning electron microscope, we actually use electromagnetic lenses. So they're essentially like, uh, if you've ever pulled apart a motor and seen the, the, the copper coils in there, in the motor, you know, one of these lenses in the electron microscope looks very similar to that. Essentially, they're copper coils, and then we can very finely adjust the current, and then we can focus the beam or move the beam or scan it using those essentially electric coils in the system. Yeah, the crazy thing is actually the lenses in, my, in electron microscopes are really, really bad. Um, if we could make a really perfect lens and get a really perfect point down to close to the wavelength of an electron, we could do way better than we do. But I, I remember someone using the analogy of uh, using the lenses of, a, of an electron microscope is it's like trying to look through the bottom of an old glass Coke bottle and using that as an optical. That's, that's basically how good the lenses are in, a, in an electron microscope. It's just, they're very hard to control and get perfect. So with most modern technology now, you know, the desktop microscopes that I rent, those have resolution that can get down to five to 10 nanometers, which is that's kind of a, a best case scenario. I usually, usually you'd use something like three times that to actually say, well, we can detect the feature down to maybe 20 nanometers. The full size systems are a bit better. This one behind me is actually brand new. This has a resolution of three nanometers, but some of the very expensive systems go down to 0 0.7, 0 0.8 nanometers resolution. Yeah. So Neil, what is like you mentioned the, the perfect lens. What is the main inhibitor uh, in terms of developing that? Like what makes that so challenging? Is it the fact that it's just like the electron length that you need to make that like focal point? Yeah, there's a couple things, right? There's, um, there's different types of aberration you get in the lenses. So one is chromatic, what they call chromatic aberration, which is just your electrons coming out of your electron beam. So, so the way these work, right? There's a source usually that gets heated very hot. Sometimes it's a tungsten source. Sometimes it's a, a crystal like lanthanum hexaboride. But the, the whole point of it is we're heating the source up really hot so that we can get a lot of electrons coming off the source. But then to get them to actually accelerate to a certain voltage, there's actually um, a, volt, a very high voltage applied just below where that electron gun is. And the issue is that you get, you get what they call chromatic aberration, which means that not all the electrons are coming off at the exact same energy. So you can set the source to say, I want 30,000 volts. But the reality is that like some of those are coming out at 29,500 volts. Some of them are coming out at, you know, 30,500 volts and you don't get a perfect voltage coming off the source. So that's one, uh, you know, one of the reasons the lenses are not perfect um, is up at the source. And then the other is just what they call spherical aberration. Um, so on the very high end systems, you know, especially the transmission electron microscopes, they're now putting in aberration correction for the lenses. It's too cost prohibitive to do it on a on a standard SEM, at least still right now. But but yeah, that that just comes from the fact that again, you you know, we can only machine. You have such a, a tiny beam of electrons coming down. You just can't machine like a perfect part and and wind a nice copper coil around it. That's perfect. Maybe in the future we'll be able to make like atomically smooth electron lenses or something with some new, new manufacturing technique, but. To date, they haven't really perfected the the lenses to a point where they can get down. You know, if, if you looked at a just the wavelength of electrons at like 10 kV, I mean, you should be able to get down to I think it's like 0.1 angstrom resolution, which is ridiculous. I mean, that's smaller than an atom, right? But obviously, we we do much poorer than that just because of the lenses. Interesting. So um, another really cool aspect of scanning electron microscopy. 
um, is that they can use electrons to kind of reveal the elements that make up uh, any given sample or at least like regions uh, with like a high concentration of that element. Um, and so that chemical analysis technique is called energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy or EDS or EDX. Um, could you briefly explain how that process works and how that's the, how that mechanism is different than the one SEM uses to collect an image? So anytime, anytime you hit a sample with a higher high energy electron beam, essentially you, you generate x-rays. Um, it's the same, actually, most people don't realize this, but even in those, you know, medical x-ray machines that you go to, if you break a bone and you need a, an x-ray, those are actually, there's actually an electron gun in there that's generating the x-ray. It's, it's essentially an electron gun that has a, some kind of piece of either nickel foil, copper foil, or another type of metal that just bombards this piece of metal and, and that creates the x-ray beam that they use for imaging. But yeah, so the reason that those x-rays form is um, as we're bombarding the sample with electrons, there's some probability that if you think of an atom, you know, you've got your nucleus and then you have electrons kind of, you know, floating around the outside of it. If you end up knocking out some of those electrons around the atom, especially the ones that are close to the, to the nucleus, it puts, the, it puts that atom in an excited state for just a very short period of time. And what happens naturally is some of the outer shell electrons, the ones that are further outside that are not as close to the nucleus, they drop down to fill in those holes. They, they just don't like being in a, in a positive or excited state. And when that happens, you generate an x-ray and that x-ray energy is actually um, exactly related to the difference in those two electron shells, the one that dropped down to fill in the, the hole. And so depending on the element, you can get actually a lot of x-ray lines. You know, when you get something heavier like gold, you get, you know, a huge number of different x-ray lines because they, gold has a lot of electron shells. When you look at something lighter like carbon, you just have essentially one potential peak that you can get. And so this has been known for a long time, this, this, that you form x-rays. And now we have software that can collect those, actually quantify them really well. With most elements, we can detect, detect chemistries down to 0.1 weight percent, which is pretty good. It's pretty accurate. Yeah, so we use this all the time. It's actually probably one of the most useful things about a scanning electron microscope is that you can stick down a very, very small spot and analyze the chemistry of, you know, maybe a one to three micron type volume of your sample. So very small features. Yeah, that, that's incredibly useful. I know I've used that and I'm sure a lot of people use that for their research. It's just, it's an incredibly powerful tool. One other thing that maybe you can explain a little bit more before we move on is uh, what sample is that can be used in SEM? I, I know that in my laboratory, it was very specific, the types. And so what systems are not good to be put into the SEM and why can't they actually be imaged or maybe even dangerous to the uh, machinery itself? Yeah, I think I mentioned before that the, the electron microscope requires a vacuum system. And so your sample is always under vacuum. So you always have to kind of keep that in mind. And in general, we, we say that we don't try imaging very wet or oily samples. Anything that will kind of evolve or, or come off in the vacuum system is generally just bad for an SEM. And you have to be careful with other samples. You know, we look at a lot of things like nanoparticles, you know, metal nano, nanoparticles that are really small. And if you don't really adhere them well to, you know, oftentimes we use um, like a conductive carbon tape. Um, if you don't adhere them well and kind of blow them off with air, you can get contamination of your system. You know, you can get those powders can get sucked up into the column. Yeah, we definitely, I mean, we definitely have to be careful. But that being said, I mean, there are even, for example, environmental scanning electron microscopes where they actually spray the samples with water. Um, so you can look at wet samples in those types of systems. So yeah, there are specialized systems that you can, you can do that with. Yeah, I, I remember in my time in the university, someone put a magnetic sample into the holder and it shut down the SEM for weeks. Um, so, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, it's an incredibly powerful machinery, but also a little sensitive, especially on the cheaper systems that don't have all these protections. I guess moving forward, um, from my own experience as an MSc student and speaking with other MSc students, it's very common for us to learn and operate SEMs at some point in the curriculum. And I've actually used 
uh, what you're talking about, the Phenom desktop system before. And it's a very good intro, very easy to use and very uh, cheap to use compared to a full size, at least at my university. I, I guess from your point of view, uh, what was the realization that there is a market for renting SEMs and contracting EDS work? Yeah, like I said before, I think in my previous job when we we would run into times where we just needed more equipment or more throughput. And in that in that other job I was working, I also had the opportunity to work with a lot of smaller businesses that were doing things like materials development. And a lot of those companies actually they didn't have access to their own electron microscope. Some of them would try to get into universities and that can be a mixed bags. You know, some universities are really well set up to do that and others not so much. And so that really became my like my main goal for opening the business is I wanted to, it, it, SEM is such a powerful technology. It's really, if you could pick one tool that you wanted to have as a, you know, someone in material science, you'd probably, you'd probably want like a furnace and a scanning electron microscope and you'd be, you'd be pretty well set like with those two things for a lot of, a lot of what you need to do. So yeah, I, I, I really wanted to be able to bring this technology to more companies. You know, I, I just couldn't picture myself in a scenario where I was trying to develop some new material, but then I wouldn't have the ability to look at it or try to tweak things after doing some kind of experiment to it. So that was my main driving goal was like this technology exists. If we can kind of almost come up with this shared cost model where a company doesn't have to shell out, you know, $150,000 to buy, buy a microscope when they may not need it all the time, it would work well for everybody. So that was, that was the main driving force. So how did the like contracting SEM and EDS projects come into play? Did that come after? And, um, do you see more often that like smaller companies are more willing to kind of just outsource that work to you rather than renting the SEM um, for themselves? Yeah. So yeah, that came after actually, I just, I've just started doing this contract SEM work within the past year. As I left my previous employer, I had an agreement with them that you know, I, I couldn't do that type of work while I was working there. Um, and I, and I had gotten a lot of requests for it. So you know, typically if we're going to go rent a system, say we are shipping it out to the West coast to California, we have a minimum rental rate of a month. I was getting a lot of requests where customers were saying like, Hey, I only have five samples. I don't think it's enough that we want to rent for a full month. Um, but could we just send you samples and you can analyze, analyze them and send us the data. And until recently I couldn't really do that. So I think it was a natural progression of, you know, there was enough demand there that I said, yeah, okay, it makes sense. And that's actually why I just bought this, this full-size SEM, which is that this is a Thermo Fisher Axia. Uh, it's, they call it a chemisem, which is, it's got crazy fast chemical mapping, which is, which is really helpful for a lot of the um, analytical work that I do. So this is kind of my workhorse SEM that I'm using for the hourly analytical work now. That's awesome. So let's, let's get into like some of the applications of SEM, because I feel like there is endless potential projects in, in any industry. Um, but this one you, you actually mentioned before this recording, and I'm like a crime show junkie. So um, like forensics was, is always interesting to me. And you mentioned that SEMs can be used for like gunshot residue analysis. Can you talk about that in a little bit more detail? Like what exactly does SEM do in, in these instances of uh, just measuring or, or looking for gunshot residue? Yeah, so it's a, it's a pretty cool application for SEM. Um, and actually, the, uh, the gunshot residue systems that I've seen at some of these crime labs, they're actually built on the same phenom systems that we rent out. They're just, they have an additional piece of software added to them. And essentially what it does is it, it uses the imaging. So it'll use backscattered imaging. Um, I didn't get into maybe details of, of the different imaging modes of the SEM, but one of the modes we use a lot is called backscattered electron imaging. And essentially the, the electrons can, can sort of, these are incident electrons from the beam that are bounced back. They interact at the atomic level. And so the heavier the atoms are in your sample, the more of these electrons you get scattered back to the detector. So something like lead that's very heavy shows up bright in a backscattered image, whereas something like carbon or oxygen that's very light shows up darker. And that can be very useful for just even if you didn't have a chemical analysis detector on your on your system, you can, you know, gain a little bit of insight into 
what's what's maybe in your sample from looking at contrast from the backscattered image. But in a gunshot residue system, it actually uses that backscattered image. They have tiny little, actually, I think I have one right here. They have tiny little half inch stubs like this, little aluminum stubs that they will put a piece of conductive carbon tape on and they'll actually swab the victims. I think they swab their wrist area and they may swab clothing and things like that. And then what they do is actually they load these these tiny little half inch stubs into the stage and they may put 20 or 30 of these in at a time. And they've got specialized software that'll use the imaging, it'll use the backscattered imaging to detect any tiny little particle on that stub. And if it finds a particle, it'll go in, stick a spot down with the beam, actually take the chemical analysis of it for a few seconds and then move on to the next particle. And so it does this in a way actually where just on a single stub, you may be picking up 10,000 or 20,000 particles and analyzing them on a stub. And they're looking really for like two or three specific element combinations together that are, you know, that are known to be there in gunshot residue. So yeah, it's, it's automated software. Once they load those sample stubs in, they kind of, you know, show the defined areas in the software, hit a button, say go, and you know, the thing will run for like a day, just chugging through analyzing particles and and seeing if there's any that are consistent with gunshot residue. I guess the broader implication is that, so this would just help them identify whether there is or not, and then just link that with someone's hand. Yeah. So I, I think on like a normal suspect, right, they may get like five to six different samples from different areas, maybe different hands, you know, the two hands and wrists and then clothing and things like that. So yeah, I think once they, I think they probably have to find, you know, more than a single particle, but yeah, my, my understanding is it's, it's pretty obvious if, you know, if there's a positive for gunshot residue, they'll just, they see it all over and there'll be, you know, lots of particulate that show, you know, that positive ID with those, those elements that they're looking for. Wow, that's that's amazing that SEM could be used like that. I had no idea. Another interesting application of SEM uh, is for additive manufacturing or 3D printing. And when you're looking at additively manufactured parts under an SEM, you can see things such as like the porosity or the grain size or chemical defects within your piece that you printed. Why is this important to use SEM to analyze uh, these additively manufactured parts? And how does it help additive manufacturers compare the products to traditionally manufactured parts? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we get a lot of customers looking at additively manufactured parts. It's like obviously a, a big thing in industry right now. Actually, I, I'm, I just read the other day that President Biden is, in, is announcing some big additive initiative um, in the US. I don't know the details of that. I just read that the other day. But um, yeah, so I think we just, you know, we know a lot about traditionally manufactured parts, things like cast or forged parts and what the properties should be. And then as people started making these additive parts, you know, there's defects that get generated that people don't understand well. I think we're learning, you know, obviously additive now has been around for a number of years. So people are learning a lot more. I think they understand more than they used to. But I don't think most people realize that, you know, most 3D printed parts, if you 3D print a metal part. It just doesn't just come out of the 3D printer and you stick it in your car or or whatever you're making and, and drive off. You know, a lot of those parts are are further densified after the fact because they have a lot of porosity in them. And so porosity is a big thing in additive manufactured parts. You definitely get porosity, you know, much more porosity than you'd get in a traditional casting. So that has to be dealt with in a lot of times they'll hot isostatic press a part after it after it's been you know, 3D printed, but then the microstructure and chemical defects as well, right? Because you're starting with powder materials, there's more of a chance that you could have, you know, for example, if you're additively printing an aluminum part and you were making a stainless steel part just before you printed your aluminum part, if you didn't perfectly clean out your, you know, material feed system, right? You might get some stainless steel particles in your aluminum and that could be really bad for the properties. So things like that, uh, they're also using electron microscopes. I don't have one on this system behind me here right now, but they're also, they make something called an electron backscatter detector, which will actually, it's kind of a diffraction technique and it'll actually analyze the grain size. You can scan the beam over your sample and get a grain map. And not only will it show you the grain 
orientation at every point, but you can clearly see grain boundaries and then you can look at plastic deformation and twinning and all kinds of all kinds of interesting things in the microstructure. So they're using actually um, electron backscatter diffraction. They're using that a lot in the additive field right now. You've named a lot of really cool modules, such as like this gunshot residue module or diffraction or all these different modules. And so is the information all there and it's just our constant working on understanding what we're reading or as we advance, we've gotten better sensors and then this has now become available. Uh, what is kind of driving the innovation on that front to get some of these cool techniques to understand what we're seeing? Yeah, I think a lot of the innovation to date has really been software driven. I mean, the hardware, the hardware has been there for a while. I mean, obviously it's gotten better and better. We've been able to get better resolution, but and the detectors obviously are, are always improving. Just as an example, I remember when I first started running electron microscopes and we'd want to take a chemical map with, you know, with EDS, we would set it up and we'd let it run overnight. And oftentimes it would run for six hours, 10 hours. Now, like this new system behind me, this will run a chemical map basically in real time. I mean, it's maybe 30 seconds uh, or a little bit longer to get a, a nice clean chemical map. And it's it's all software driven. So so this is, um, you know, traditionally the way an SEM would process signals, the images would just be collected as images. So if you're looking for a backscattered image, you're collecting the backscattered electrons with that particular detector. The same with chemical analysis. If you're looking for EDS analysis or chemical analysis, you're collecting just the x-rays coming off the signal. Now they're getting really smart. So this system behind me actually has some machining, machine learning built into it, where it's actually using the contrast from the backscattered image to, to create, they call them super pixels, but basically it's using the information in the backscattered image to process the electron mapping much quicker than it could otherwise. So instead of just waiting forever to collect all these x-rays that take longer to collect it says okay i've got this backscattered image with contrast that that's a starting point so instead of starting with a tiny pixel size it starts with you know a much larger pixel whatever the feature size is in your image and then from there as it collects more and more data it gets you know it gets more and more refined and that pixel size kind of shrinks down but it's a really cool application for something like machine learning where we have two signals so let's one let's use one of those signals to our advantage to process the other one faster and that's really where all of this is going right the software has gotten better and better and I, I can see it continuing to progress that way where we're just we can just collect data so fast it's crazy we just bury ourselves in data that's awesome I mean speaking of machine learning ML and AI just they seem to be finding their way into like every industry. Um, so in what ways, other than you just mentioned, like the operational efficiency, in what ways could incorporating machine learning and artificial intelligence into SEMs improve their like analysis capabilities, for, for example? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. And I'm, and I'm probably not the best person to answer that. I'm not a machine learning expert, but I think, like I just mentioned, you know, we bury ourselves in data and I still spend a lot of time having to like pour through and analyze data, make sure the software is identifying things correctly and that we're interpreting the data correctly. And that's still a very time intensive thing. So even if I can collect the whole pile of data, then me or someone else still needs to kind of go through that and analyze it. And so I think that's the next step in sort of integrating machine learning and AI into something like an electron microscope. You're going to see more and more of that probably data interpretation, I guess. I don't know how I'll totally be able to replace a human yet, but I think they'll definitely implement things to, to keep moving along that path and make things much more user-friendly from an analysis standpoint, where right now I can collect data in like five minutes and then Sometimes I have to spend a half an hour analyzing it. So it used to be that the data collection was the bottleneck and now it's the data interpretation. So I'm hoping that uh, some of these really smart AI machine learning companies are going to start tackling those problems next. Well, one of the things that I go along with machine learning and AI is the data needed. And in a previous call, you mentioned one of the biggest challenges is data management for SEMs. So like you said, we're basically being buried in this all this data. So could you explain why data management is an inherent challenge for current SEMs and how new machines with maybe the new AI or new ML may be able to tackle these challenges in a better way? 
Yeah, I think I, I talked about some of those challenges already. I think in, in addition to having to analyze all that data and, and interpret it, you have to store it somewhere too. And it's not uncommon for me, you know, if I sit down at the microscope and run this all day for eight or 10 hours, you know, sometimes I'm generating like a hundred gigs of data a day. I mean, it's, it can be a lot. So yeah, you can sign up for your, you know, cloud storage account. Eventually you're going to be paying for many terabytes of data. So the storage is definitely still a problem. You know, it's not insurmountable, but we can buy external hard drives and just keep filling them up. But yeah, it's really the the interpretation that I think is the hard part. So I, I think that's the part that takes a lot of experience as a user, you know, using the system, learning, learning what different things mean. And even where, you know, in EDS, you can get peak overlaps, you can get artifacts. Sometimes the software will, will still, you know, even the soft, even though the software is very good, it'll still incorrectly identify elements to be one thing when you know it's really something else. And so without that user interaction, you know, it's, it's hard to automate that part of the process, but yeah, that that's where, like I said, I think, I think everything's going in that direction. So, you know, I hope at some point they'll even be, um, you know, you may even have a more automated system, right? Where if you're collecting sample for a specific job or customer on a specific product, you can kind of tag that, right? And then the next time you go to analyze that, the microscope can pull up all those same conditions that you used previously, and then even maybe compare the current data to the previous data sets to see where there may be discrepancies. That's something right now that if it exists, I don't know about it. Maybe it does, but I, I could definitely see things going in that direction. That's awesome. All right. So I guess like you've really discussed it in detail, but SEM is a great tool for MSE students and professionals alike to kind of have in their repertoire. So to wrap up this episode, could you give your like final piece of advice to our listeners who maybe just like just starting out or not a ton of experience with scanning electron microscopy um, in terms of like next steps or how they can really take advantage of SEMs to um, analyze and make innovations in the space. You know, the best thing is to try to get your hands on a, a, on a scanning electron microscope. If you're really interested in it, the best way of learning anything is to just dive in and start playing around with it. So I got my first exposure to it at a university, which I think is the case for a lot of people. So if you end up going into material science or they even use these systems for a lot of biological applications, there are a lot of different fields. It's not just material science. Yeah, try to get your hands on, a, on an SEM, start playing around with it, get curious, start looking at just random things. For a while at my house, I was actually letting food get moldy in the refrigerator on purpose because I got fascinated with all these different types of, uh, I'm not a, a mold spore expert, but different types of foods grow different types of mold spores and mold looks really cool under the SEM. So in my early, uh, like when I first started the company up, I was, I had like, like 10 or 20 different types of moldy foods that I was uh, putting in the SEM and was pretty fascinated by that. My recent thing now that I'm just kind of getting into in my free time, which I don't have very much free time right now, but I actually bought some meteorite samples. So I'm starting to look at some meteorite samples. Just, I think those are pretty cool also. But yeah, there's lots of applications. You know, my, I'll just give people the advice I got when I was younger. My, my parents always told me, you can do anything you want. You can make a living doing anything you want, as long as you pick something that you really love to do. And I found that with material science and specifically finding my niche with the microscopy side of things. You know, I come to work every day and, you know, I have good and bad days just like everybody, but I'd love running microscopes. So coming in, I'm like a little kid every day, like getting to look at something new under the microscope. So it's a lot of fun. And I think if you approach things that way, you know, if you get into a career and you're really finding that you're, you're just not feeling it, I mean, you're never too old to, to go find, find something that you love to do. So that's what I would, that's the advice I would give. I love that advice. Thank you so much, Neil, for, for joining us today. It was an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was great. As a materials engineer, we can make an impact in nearly every single industry, but with that versatility comes a lot of different options to choose from. So if you have no idea which industry or position is right for you, believe me, you're not alone. I've been there, done that. But just for a moment, imagine narrowing down your ideal role and company by the end of this week. Imagine being able to secure your dream job offer without having to apply to hundreds of job openings. Our online course, MSE Academy, includes video testimonials, resumes, 
interview prep and mentorship from materials engineers who have been in your shoes. We also connect our members with companies and industry professionals in our expansive network to help accelerate your job search as much as possible. To learn more and get started, simply click the link in the description below. And if you enroll within the next 24 hours, we'll add three bonus career development resources. I hope to see you there.